Hello, everyone. Um, wow, I've got crisp in my teeth. Hang on. I'm so sorry. I've just ate like a massive bag of crisps. Um, hello, my name's Danika. Um, I use they and she pronouns. I don't mind which one you use. Um, as long as you use both. Um, I I guess I'm a writer, but I still I'm still in that weird position of like still figuring out what that word means for me. So like I think we all kind of get there with that and what it means. Um, and I want to preface the workshop with saying that I am by no means an expert on any of this. It's just something that I've um, kind of, as a practice I've kind of been developing over the past couple of years of like um, being, um, being bored by, being bored of being told how I'm meant to write and, um, and being like, do we really need to do that? Is that really where we're at now? Um, so this is something this is much a learning session for me as it is for like everybody else and like it's like a collaborative space I'm still figuring it out myself um so um I think the reason why Boxer Tricks asked me to do this session is because I don't really believe in structure I do believe in it but I don't really believe in it um I feel like it can be kind of like a tool of like curtailing creativity sometimes and it can be something that us as writers find really scary and really like limiting and it's almost like a bit of a prison around us and I feel like it just shouldn't be that way it should be something that's really nice and enjoyable um so um I started thinking about this in my own practice when when I'd written quite a lot but like a play I wrote a couple of years ago um called Sappho when I wrote that, um, I wanted it to, the basic the plot of it is, is kind of escaping predestined cycles of what you're meant to do. And when I was writing it, I was thinking about structure. I was thinking about that. I'm doing that because everybody knows what that is, I'm guessing. That weird curvy line thing that we get told is how you're meant to do a story. And I just couldn't fit it into it. I just couldn't, for the life of me, do it. And then I thought... If I'm writing a story about breaking a cycle, why would I then fit it into a, a structure that isn't breaking of a cycle? And I was like, oh, all right then. Okay. And I followed that road. And then years later, I'm here. So <laughs> I'm presuming it's to be down the right place. Um, so this session is kind of going to be... Um, structured over a couple of things structure for a structure session and um, we're going to spend the first kind of um five ten minutes um talking about us and why we're here and what we want then we're going to spend a little while looking at what structures we are told to do then we're going to spend a little while thinking about how narrative can affect structure and then we're going to do a little bit about how identity can affect structure and then at the end, how to subvert structure and use these structures to your advantage. So I hope that kind of makes sense. And um, we'll do about um, 40 minutes, then we'll have a break and then we'll do 40 minutes. Um, I hope that's good with everyone. I can't work for very long periods of time. My disabled brain won't do it. So let's just keep going and do that. Um, so I suppose I'm interested um, and I'm going to keep it as a chat function, if that's all right. Um, if you could put in the chat, um, a small sentence about why you signed up to do this masterclass um, and I'll give you like I don't know 45 seconds a, a minute to do that uh, amazing these are all really really fab um, and if you um, haven't had a chance to put in the chat and you want to keep working through what that is you can put in anything in the chat whenever you get to it these are fab yeah I'm with you on all of this like I don't really get it either I don't understand why we have to put our characters into this linear way it seems to be a framework but like how do you even learn the framework it's almost like this inside thing it's like it's almost like this inside like it's not a joke but do you know what I mean it's like an inside joke of yeah your structure isn't quite there and it's like yeah but what is what actually is it like where do you learn it um, and get this struck, yeah, all of them. So I'm going to, um, yeah, that, that seems great actually. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to share my screen. Oh God, I haven't been on Zoom in so long. 
Um, desktop. No, not that one. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, let me try that again. Share screen. Here we are. We're open. So structure. Um, <laughs> really simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this one, this is the one we all kind of know, right? This is the one we're told that has to happen. You have an introduction, you have your inciting incident, the rise in action, it's that curve, it's the curve that we all think happens. I suppose this is like typical structure. I don't even know what the name for it is, but it's the one we're told all to do, right? Um, yeah. Um, then we have things like, so here we are, another breakdown of it. So another three act structure. You have your inciting incident, you have your rise in action, you have your midpoint, you have your climax. And that's how we're told to fit all these different stories into this thing right here. We have a hero's journey. We'll all have done this one. So I don't know um, if anyone wants to unmute and let me know a story that fits into like the hero's journey. Any story. Could be a fairy tale, could be a play, could be a TV show. If we can't, that's okay. Maybe things like Harry Potter that fits into the hero's threshold. Things like, yeah, and let's see what's in the chat. Yeah, Ben's yeah. saying Lord of the Rings, yeah. Yeah, Lord of the Rings, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything like that, we've got a person going on a journey to get something and coming back. That's the hero's journey. Um, you've got this one. I don't actually, I didn't actually know this was the name for it, but it's the one where you go crisis, 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 climax, and we're done. So things where bad things will happen or like you'll get to one point, oh, I need to go back down again. Then get to another point, oh, it's, it's like, it is, it is climbing up a mountain and falling and, and getting back. It's, what's that song, that Paula Abdul song? Two steps forward, was it? One step forward and two steps back. I feel like it's like the other way around. It's like one step, there's like two steps forward, but one step back the other way around with this one. It's keep moving forward and then coming back, move forward, coming back, blah, 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 blah. Away, from, away from the objective, keep trying to get there. And we have this other one here, the plot pyramid. So going, tch, tch, tch. so you've got your exposition, you arrive in the movement, you climax, you fall in accident, um, action, and then the movement afterwards. Now, all these are just, they're just examples. And I think I'm going to stop sharing now. And I think what we do is we get too wrapped up in all of these, that these are how we're meant to do story. And I just don't know if they work all the time or whether we've exhausted these structures. Um, how does anyone feel about any of those that we've just talked about? Do people recognize them? Have people seen them before? Um, are they familiar, are they unfamiliar? Um, unmute and talk or put in the chat how you feel about them anyone can say anything yeah I feel like sorry I'm just gonna go, <laughs> go ahead. Um, I feel like yeah I recognize all those structures um, but I agree it's hard in terms of I think sometimes especially because like especially this is talking about you know this mass class is talking about narrative as well and it's like how when you've already got a story and you've already created a world in your mind and you already know those people really well and you know like their tics and their isms and what they would do and how they would behave in certain situations sometimes it feels like you're almost ticking a box to apply those things at those times for it to happen and then if you don't you almost feel like as if the story the audience aren't going to be rewarded with the thing that they you know the thing that they've signed up for you know even when you know the play isn't on or the the piece of television isn't on in your head i think well in my head i'm always thinking you know you want to think it's just about your story but it's hard when that is there because it's like it's almost as if you're already including everyone else and it's like i don't want to include you not for now do you know what i mean i want to write my story mm. yeah i hear all of that i hear all of that um, has anyone got anything else they'd like to say about it um, yeah, I wanted to say, like, I feel like now when I'm watching films, I feel like I can see where, like, the midpoint is. And, like, I'm like, oh, there's the inciting incident. And it's, like, because I've read about these things, it kind of um, bums me out a bit sometimes because I'm, like, it's boring. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's predictable. 
And I think sometimes, I think you're right, it can be boring. And sometimes that predictability can be really lovely. Like, I love watching trash daytime television. And I don't know if it's because I'm constantly an out of work actor. Well, I'm not constantly out of work, but when I'm an out of work actor, I'm an out of work writer. I like to watch daytime television. I love it. And I love programs like Homes Under the Hammer because I know what's coming. It's comforting to me. So I know that this is going to happen then. I love watching Grand Designs because I know there's going to be a crisis point halfway through. I know at 20 to 9, the woman's going to get pregnant. And I know at quarter past quarter past um, 8, Kevin's going to go, I don't know if they're ever going to be able to do this, ever. Like, I know that then things are going to happen in them times and they can be comforting. But like you say, when you're watching something, if you're watching something that's meant to be comforting, if you're watching something that's meant to be habitual, then that's great. But is that always the best thing for a story? Do you want someone to feel comforted by it or do you want someone to be constantly surprised or for a story to go somewhere you didn't expect it to? Um, I think that's why people love like shows like um, love daytime television and why they still work. Why we love quiz shows because you know what's going to happen. Um, why Dickinson's Real Deal is still on. Why Supermarket Suite is still on because you know what's going to happen. Um, yeah. Anyone else got any other thoughts? Um, <clears throat> I didn't know. I didn't know about was it fic ficti fictian? Yeah, I guess I think yeah. that's what it's called. Yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't, I've learned something uh, already. I, I had no idea about that. Um, this crisis, crisis, crisis. I, I, I don't, I don't, maybe that'd be like a farce or something. I don't know. I was trying to think like what it would fit into. Uh, that's really cool. Um, and yeah, I, like, I, I, I totally agree with, like, I think we see the hero's journey like so much and that kind of that because of, like, because it's really satisfying to be like, ah, oh, and then, oh, and then, oh no, they're going to do it. And then they do it. Um, and that's like really like like saying like all the superhero films and all that kind of stuff like it's really that it, it, it's really satisfying to and it is it, and in a way that can make it feel quite corporate uh, maybe that's savage to say but like almost like it's quite satisfying in its resolution whereas maybe if you want something that doesn't have that kind of you know all tied up in a bow ending that you'd have to stray outside of that but we often don't see that and probably because it is more people want to feel satisfied at the end of art and that's not always the effect we want to have as writers or or the point of art you know a lot of the time but I understand why people like that mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense <laughs> it makes complete sense I think you're right like people do want to be comforted and like satiated and satisfied at the end of a story sometimes it's why the Marvel universe exists. It's why Lord of the Rings was so good. It's why Harry Potter exists because you know it's gonna, you know that's gonna happen, and you know that good will triumph over evil most of the time. Most of the time, it doesn't always, but most of the time it does. And yeah, yeah, all of them things. Yeah, I think it for me it kind of comes back to that initial provocation and why people are here tonight, and actually people that that, that kind of love hate relationship that we have with structure and I'm talking more of you know from the perspective of dramaturging work and like you know and I think I think that structure too often is seen as like a something that you have to learn rather than a something that frees up a way of telling the story that you want to tell you know and I and I, I understand that, that I'm get you know straying into the world of semantics there but like I think for me it's like it should be something that kind of goes, ah, yes, I could tell the story in this way. And it's and it comes back to what, you know, the story that you want to tell. Like, if you want to tell, there's nothing wrong with telling a very predictable hero story. You know, if that's if that's the story you want to tell, and it's, as you say, it's quite satisfying as an audience. We, we understand that three-act structure and, you know, there's a satisfying predictability to that. But actually, if you want to subvert that, if that's not the story you want to tell, then actually don't try and um uh shoehorn or, or not shoehorn like um force a structure onto something that doesn't want to have that structure um you know like i remember a lot of the time when we were developing spark plug with david judge like a lot of the time he'd be going can i do that am i allowed to do that and we're like yeah and like and, and, and like with road comets i remember a lot of the time you're like oh can i do that yeah why not you know and I think it's that it's that that permission that we sort of feel like a lot of the time that we have to kind of abide by these rules otherwise 
it's going to get rejected out of hand, you know, either by producers or audiences. And I think there's there's a danger that we get a right by numbers approach that everything becomes this kind of homogenous story, you know, when actually we don't just want that from art. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I hear all of that. Um, so suppose the next part is how do we fuck that all off and have a go at something else? <laughs> um, so, um, so when I first was having a look into this, I had a really, really amazing workshop on um, a writing course I was doing with um, a writer called Chino Adimba. And she's a playwright, she's a writer, she runs a company called Tight of Hootsie, which is like a um, Southwest based, Southwest, aren't they? They're in Bristol, aren't they? Southwest based theatre company. And um, we talked about the play Generations by Debbie Tucker Green. And it absolutely blew my mind. I was like, what? When I read it, I was like, oh my gosh. So the play is about um, different generations of the same family who live together, who are affected by the AIDS crisis in South Africa. And it's about losing the younger generations before the older ones. And she structured it. She used that narrative to structure the play. And I was like, okay, okay. So as the play went on, it was the same scene we played over and over again, but the younger voices got lost. So it became only the older people left at the end of the play. And I was like, genius. I was like, Debbie Tucker Green is a genius. I was like, it blew my, it blew my tiny mind. And it was that, that point where I thought, I don't need to do anything. And that the narrative has completely informed the structure. That's the experience she's writing about. She's writing about, she's writing about a family losing the young people before the old people, which is almost the reverse way of how we're told humanity exists, right? We, 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 are, we expect to lose the older generations before the younger generations, which is why when, when you do lose a child or you, you, or you lose a younger family member or you lose a younger friend at a time that they shouldn't, it's the most devastating thing ever. When you lose a grandparent, it is devastating, but there is a kind of thing that we set ourselves up for, that that is the natural order of things. That's how it should be. And to completely subvert that and go, well, I'm going to pull them away and to leave the older people left. I was like, oh my gosh. So she used the experience to inform the narrative. So I'm going to just throw you into a deep end, into the deep end with a writing exercise. And I want you to all put in the chat separately. So like one and then press enter and then another press enter. Three different experiences. So it could be getting a taxi to a funeral. It could be going ice skating. It could be having an affair. It could be um, creating your life's work. Just an experience. If you put three of those in the chat and just bomb them all in there, blah, 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 blah. Could be any, any experience ever. Could be getting your hair done. It could be losing a child. It could be anything. All right, keep them coming if you've not got them all in there already, but they, there's loads in there. Um, and I want us to take um, the next five minutes. I want you to take one of them experiences from the chat that you didn't put in there. So one that someone else wrote in there. I want you to take one of them experiences and I want you to spend the next five minutes deconstructing what the structure of that experience is. So for example, not one that's in there. Um, it could be losing an earring down a sink. So it could be taking the earring out, putting it on the shelf. It falls into the sink. It rolls around the edge of the sink. And then it goes down the plug hole. It gets stuck in the U-bend. You pour the water in to make it flush and go all the way around and it's gone. And that's it, gone forever. So that would be the structure of that experience. So you to take one of these experiences that you've not put in the chat, spend the next five minutes deconstructing the things that happen in that experience um, and then come back. So yeah. Give five minutes, so come back at, I don't know, 
Let's give six minutes. No, let's give seven. Come back at five past seven <laughs> with the full deconstruction of that. And within the full deconstruction, I want you to find five beats. So five beats of things that happen. So I need to deconstruct it and then I want you to find five beats. Um, so we're just doing an exercise at the moment. Um, um, I don't know if you can see the chat previously to what's happened. I'm guessing not. But we've um, thought about some different experiences you would have. So there's things in here like second dates, arguing with your mum, singing in the shower, losing your slippers. Um, and we've just gone ahead and spent a couple of minutes individually picking one of these and figuring out what the structure of that experience is. So... Um, for an example, I also did this exercise. It was nice to do. Um, I picked getting hit on, like I said, getting hit by a piece of fallen scaffolding. So the things that happened in that is I went, I'm, I'm leaving the house. I'm walking to get the bus. I hit, I'm hit on the head and I pass out. Other people come and save me. And I wake up someone new and my body's irreversibly changed. Which may be a bit dramatic, but... <laughs> I wanted to just go there. <laughs> so um, what the structure of that would be, would be my first beat would be normal, completely what you would expect to happen. The second beat would be normal, completely what you would expect to happen. Third beat, blackout, gone, gone. The fourth beat would be a moment where I wouldn't be present. And the fifth beat would be a new world. So that's kind of how that experience would be structured. Um, has anyone got one they'd like to share? Or any thoughts they'd like to share about that exercise? It's okay if not. <laughs> Go on, Liv, yes. I, uh, um, sorry, I just thought it was really interesting to sort of, um, go go back to like um stripping it back to just like what happens rather than making it really complicated um so i did losing your slippers um and i put so like yeah you have your slippers on one night with your feet up watching the end of eastenders the episode finishes and you finish your decaf so then you start to go upstairs you take your slippers off, get into bed, sleep, wake up the next morning and they're not by your bed. Look under the bed and they're not there. Searching in the wardrobe to see if they're there and check the other half side of the bed and still no sign. Check the bathroom to see if you've kicked them off when you're going for a piss. Not there. Go downstairs to check the living room. Not there. In the dining room, you see the dog in his bed looking suspect. So you bend down and he gets up from his bed, tail wagging, and underneath his body is the pair of slippers destroyed. <laughs> of course, the dog would eat them. My dog yeah. would eat them. My dog loves smelly things. He just eats the smelliest things. He's absolutely vile. <laughs> <laughs> so, Liv, I suppose my next question is, what, what does the structure of that feel like? So I suppose the moment is you have something really normal, you do your structure, and then there's, there's kind of lots of like frantic, 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 frantic. I don't know where this is. I don't know where this is. Trying to trace your steps back and then finding them, but they're destroyed. So what what does the structure of that kind of feel like? Um, It feels quite repetitive, mm -hmm. um, just in the sense of like consistently looking for something um, and still getting the same outcome. Yeah. So that's the main thing. And I sort of like felt that more when it was just like consistently reading out, not there, not there, not there, um, which I thought was really interesting. Because um, it's like, even though she'd be going, she'd be looking quite frantically or not, not necessarily frantically, but she'd be sort of like hurrying around, maybe like thinking like, where the fuck are they? um it's a really like it's a really mundane thing to look for something <laughs> um yeah I feel that so if you were to write the story of losing your slippers and finding them 
how do you think you could use that experience that you've just explained so the narrative of what happens to inform the structure of how you'd write it what do you mean sorry so maybe I'll hang on I'll explain myself clearer so you've just experienced the narrative of it so you've said you know you you finish watching these senders you go upstairs um, put them then you find that they're not there you find you know you're searching around mundane like looking in the same thing the same place the same place the repetitive nature of it and then you find them under something that you love and they're destroyed if you were to write that story would you use things like the repetitive nature in the structure of it so would you find yourself going one place and then one place and then one place and then one place would do the same action would you does that make sense? Am I am I making sense? Sorry. Yeah, I kind of like imagine it as like she's just constantly, almost like stuck on stuck on loop. Like you know when you know like when you used to watch videos, and like it's like a really shit copy of Tarzan, and you'd always get really stuck on on that real like peak moment, and it just keeps them going like triggering off like back and forth, back and forth. I feel like it just like there'd be I don't know how now I've just got Tarzan in my head but like <laughs> she's on stage um yeah just very much like going going round in loops um or like the the really not like boring Mario Kart circuit I think yeah it's the Luigi, where it just literally is just like one big oval mm. like just I keep like yeah that's sort of what I imagine like so, yeah and I suppose the resolution of finding the slippers under the dog what does that resolution feel like um almost I it, it feels a bit it um oh I guess always like similar to like what you just said it's like that contrast between like love and disappointment yeah <laughs> but like so it's like how how does how did how do those two things play a part um because again that also depends on what time what what point of the relationship is that so like is the dog a puppy or like a relatively young dog so then you're probably going to be a little bit more lax with it or go like oh fuck's sake or like Whereas if it's a bit older, you'd probably have a little bit less patience. She'd be like, oh, I've not changed to do this. Um, so I think that would be quite interesting in, in to see how that, how time would play in that, in that, it's not contradiction. I just, yeah, I guess like that contrast of like, mm how they how they work together absolutely absolutely um yeah so interesting thank you so much for sharing and um, has anyone else got um anything they'd like to share anything they went through any thoughts yeah i feel like doing that obviously it was only a sentence but i feel like it took the only now thinking about it it, it didn't it wasn't stressful yeah <laughs> you know what I mean like it was just like you thought you thought about the task at hand kind of thing and like the steps that you take to do that to do that thing and um a bit like what Adam said before um instead of thinking of it like you're not thinking of it as like a li it's, some, it's not going to limit me you know it's just like well no this is the like I pick singing in the shower and it's like the obvious things that we we do to do that but that kind of I don't know, maybe it's just in my head, but I feel like I lose track of that sometimes, you know what I mean? Like the obvious things um, and the, actually the enjoyment in, in just kind of saying out loud what those steps are. For sure, and there's a moment when you're having like, um, when you're singing in the shower, there's <laughs> just for yourself, it's not for anybody else, right? You don't sing in the shower for anybody else. So in the structure of, if you were to write a story, for example, about singing in the shower, there'd perhaps be a moment in the middle of it that the character just has for themselves. Yeah. A moment of like serenity or a moment of like solitude or um, 
like selfishness, but not selfish. I feel like selfish is a nasty word, but it's not a nasty word, but like a moment for yourself. Yeah, and there's something about like singing in the shower that like you, it's like a release, isn't it? Like you, like you said, you're not, you don't start singing in the shower. Well, at least I don't. Like, I don't think I'm going into full performance mode. Like you just kind of, you start singing a few lyrics, don't you? And then you feel like you're enjoying it. Mm. So then you're like, and then all of a sudden it like, you know, transcends into the full song. And then before you know it, you're like going full whack. I agree. Yeah, completely. Cool. Um, so before we break, I'm going to set you off with another five minute exercise. I want you to think of um, the theme of something you are writing at the moment or something you wish to write. So um, if you haven't got a project that's ongoing, that's okay, but something you would wish to or like a dream project. Um, so for example, the, the first example I use, my play Sappho is about escaping predestined cycles. So escaping the, the cycle of who you are supposed to be. And that would be the theme. That would be the, the kind of theme of what the play is about. And I want you to take that theme and I want you to think about how that, how that theme could affect the structure. <laughs> Sorry, that's so, am I making sense? How that theme could affect the structure. So if I'm escaping a predestinate cycle, I would write my play as a cycle. And then as I got to the end of the cycle, I would go off because I'm not in part of that cycle anymore. Or I'd be, I'm in the cycle and then I get to the end of the cycle and the entire cycle shatters and it disappears. Or if I'm escaping it, as I go through the cycle, the cycle starts to fracture as I go through and then the entirety just smashes to pieces or just disappears or just, or I go away onto, onto a different thing. Um, so yeah, think about the theme of something you're writing at the moment. Think about what it's about and think about how that's how that could affect the structure and i'm going to give you five minutes and then we're going to have a little break let's finish the sentence you're on um any thoughts anything anyone wants to share it's okay if not Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm working on a show which is about how uh, pop culture informs uh, young women's ideas around gender and sexuality as they like move from adolescence to adulthood and uh, like pop songs and music videos are a really big theme so I was trying to think about how like what is the structure of like a noughties music video um, but I think I was kind of more I think I would actually have to sit down and like watch it about answer it think of frozen yeah i've lost you there megan sorry um oh uh, sorry it's okay I, we got you to like um thinking about how you'd have to go back and watch some of them that's how we got yeah so, sorry alton i'm still here but it'll just mean that it's streams better like this um, yeah, I think I was more thinking about like the tropes and aesthetics, like structure I found a bit harder. Um, yeah, so I think I maybe was kind of thinking more dramaturgically than structurally, but still I found some interesting things. Like I was also thinking about maybe the, as a structural thing, you could have like the evolution of the use of the colour pink in popular culture or... Um, yeah, I found some like interesting things that you could kind of like string it off. But I think, I mean, I guess structure and dramaturgy are very intertwined, aren't they? But yeah, <laughs> it was useful. Yeah. Thank you. You really are. I think you've got some great thoughts there. And like, um, I suppose like my brain's going ding, 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 ding. But like you have things like you could have music videos in it and then mm -hmm. to see how the person's then affected by the music video afterwards or like how they start pulling up things from the places around them and how that becomes them or, you know, things like there's so much in there. Um, and I think you can think about the aesthetic of it as well, because it's a very aesthetic driven thing, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why would the identity be affected by it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, anyone else? Any thoughts? Um, anything they found?
Yeah, I um, I was thinking about, I've been thinking for a while about addiction and religion and how the two kind of coincide and, and can keep someone alive, even though they kind of seem from polar opposite worlds. Um, and then so I was thinking of, if we're thinking about structure, how it could, how the idea of religion, so the structure could be in, like informed by the idea of prayer so the format of prayers um, and how like we read prayers in church and like at funerals we we do readings and it could be the case that like each scene would almost be a prayer um you know it would be like a prayer from one of the young boys in that scene but maybe we wouldn't actually know they were prayers until the end you know of the play and when the prayer or the that that conclusion point it feels almost answered um and then if and then trying to like bring the addiction side of it into it it's like what having a vice like what that having a vice or that compulsion or that addictive personality or having a severe addiction does to the rhythm of our behavior and like our state of mind and that repetitiveness or that constantly like needing of something whilst trying to hide it and how and how that idea of repeating a cycle could be used in the structure um so yeah it, and I hadn't thought of it like that I mean, I thought about the addiction and religion before, but I never thought about like how the kind of structure of a prayer could, and like the layout of that, if I'm envisioning it, like how that kind of affects how then I would write the play. Yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, yeah, and like almost like the, the satiation of addiction and religion can be quite similar yeah kind of relief you get from a connection with god could sometimes mirror the relief you would get from a fix right yeah yeah um for some people that could be really similar for some people it could be really different um and the relapsing like that's an addiction thing isn't it? about relapsing about falling back into it and about how do you follow it could even be a subversion of structure how do you follow a curve whilst having a thought on something else yeah or how do you force a character to go through a curve when they're not meant to do it yeah that's so true and especially like if, if relapsing comes into it like then where do they go on the curve exactly and then do they go off do they go off piece do they have a couple of scenes blah, 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 and then do they come back to the curve yeah yeah um so it's quite interesting um any more any more for any more Um, I guess, uh, sorry, if I'm not on screen, I'm into my eyes. Uh, right. I was just thinking about, because I'm working on something that's got quite a lot of emphasis on location. Like, it, it, it's something that is, the story of the play is it, very much centred around the location of it. And therefore, because it's centred in somewhere so specific, how I can kind of start messing around with people's perceptions of, of that location and how the structure can, you know, if it's a house in the middle of nowhere, but possibly using the rooms of the house at the same time, trying to make the structure overlap with itself almost. Um, and I know that's not an original idea, but it just when I was thinking about the themes of the play and the fact that it has to be set in this specific place, then how can I make that place work for my structure, I guess? Yeah, I think place can really, really inform it. I think you've got some, some gold there. If you were to set a play in, um, I don't know, Greece, and then set a play in um, uh, Bangkok, they would be completely two, two, two separate players, right? Because the structure of them people's lives are different, completely different. Same if you were to structure something in a really, really busy flat building, you'd maybe have, what is it to experience noise above and below each scene? Or what is it to see, oh. Have I just pressed a screen share by accident? Um, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Am I all right? Sorry, I, I, I'm sorry if I press something then. I'm so awful. Um, 
yes if you experience something in a flat what's it to experience noise and uh, noise above and below so maybe you'd have like a scene but then it'd be a cacophony of noise or a cacophony of noise or, or what is it for one person to experience loneliness and then one person to be experiencing the hardest moment of their life at the same time they, that would say from a flat building or if you're in um a house in the middle of nowhere what is the structure of what that life is there you yeah know? exactly yeah i know that, that's yeah just what i was thinking about thank you yeah cool all right let's take um a five minute break so you can have a wee grab a cup of tea um do whatever you need to do let's come back at um, 1933 and then we'll start talking about um identity and structure for the last kind of portion of the session i've not got through everything we wanted to get through because i gab 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 too much but i hope it's been useful so far so yeah come back at 1933 and um we'll move on to the next part Fab, 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 fab. Um, cool. Um, all right. Um, so for the next kind of next part of the session before we finish, when do we finish? At eight? Is that right? It's so next, yeah, next 15, 20 minutes. Let's have a quick look at um what how identity can affect structure. So um, earlier on in the session, Megan, for context, um, we um, looked at some typical structures. So we looked at the hero's journey, we looked at three-act structures, the curve, all the different kind of things, the ones that we kind of all are really familiar with. And I suppose um, I want to kind of invite you all to critique that using your own identity. Um, and share as much or as little as you want with this as well, because, you know, identity is very, very personal and private thing. So this can be something that you write on your own. This can be something that you're working through. You don't have to share. That's completely fine. Um, so I suppose my first thing is if we're taking the curve, if we're taking the typical three act structure, blah, 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 it, it seems to have a very clear resolution and a satisfaction to the end of it. But I, I personally don't believe that everybody's stories experience that satisfaction and resolution at the end. And I don't necessarily think that um, it, can be a, it can be used in um, everybody's, in stories using certain identities. So, for example, um, these structures were, were not, were made by a dominant class, right? The dominant socioeconomic class in a, in a community, whatever it is, um, whatever the phrase is. And um, it's, that's not us always. Um, so why should our stories be fit to be, to be rammed into that? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Um, if you're writing a love story between a man and a woman, and then you're writing a love story between two men, they're not gonna have the same satisfaction and resolution to them because the world doesn't allow love between men to have the same satisfaction and resolution to it as a love between a man and a woman. If you're writing a story about, um, if you're writing a story about birth, and then you're writing a story about um, a rebirth of someone, so, for example, the birth of a child and the rebirth of someone as they've gone through a transition, a medical transition or a social transition, that that rebirthing or that birthing isn't going to have the same satisfaction and resolution to it because one person had a life before and one person didn't. One person's life is not going to experience satisfaction. It's going to be gristly. It's going to be grindy. And one person's will not. If um, Am I making sense as I'm going along? Let me know if I'm not. Please pitch in if I'm not. So I want you to think about, um, I want you to take a couple of minutes to um, think about things in your own identity that perhaps that perhaps um, contradict the way we're told stories exist. So um, one example could be you could um, a person a person could be um, a writer could be um, a dark skinned black woman with an invisible disability. So one thing will always be at the forefront of her identity will be her skin colour. And one thing that might be more hidden would be 
her invisible disability, her something, something that's hidden behind her. So one thing's always at the front, one thing's always back. How would that then affect the way that she'd want to write a story? One thing you could be, um, you could be a white man who's deaf. So you walk down the street, you perhaps walk down the street and no one would say anything, but the moment that someone would speak to you would be the moment where en engagement or uh, the engagement would happen and oppression would come. Um, you could be a woman who's um, going through, I don't know, you could be a woman who's going through a promotion at work and seeing a man being promoted well above your station, 20, 10, 10, 30, 40, 50 times above you, but you're doing the same amount of work or you're working harder and someone else is getting more resolution and more satisfaction out of that. So I want you to think about those things and think about how the curve, the curve we've spoken about, how your identity wouldn't be smashed into that curve because of what their reasons are. The moments where you experience more resolution or less resolution, more satisfaction, less satisfaction, the moments where they grind, the moments where they gristle, the moments where they click, the moments when it just does, it wouldn't go in no matter how much you tried. Um, am I making sense? Cool. So let's take a couple, let's take five minutes. Let's take until um, 1944, just to think about what that is um, and come back and then we'll talk about it. You, you don't need to share or whatever, but we can just talk about what we found. Okay, cool. Just finish the sentence where you're at. <clears throat> um, yeah, cool. Um, so before we get going, I thought I'd share something really useful. I was speaking with a um, speak with someone recently, and we were talking about what it is to exist in a body that um, has that faints, and not knowing when you're going to faint. And um, she described it as. Um, there is someone in the corner of the room at all times with a cricket bat and she no matter where she is she walks around and she she thinks there's someone with a cricket bat and at any particular moment that person with a cricket bat is going to whack around the head and she's going to faint and she never knows when it's going to come and we were talking about it in relation to um a story that she's wanting to write and i was saying well what's the, what's the structure of that if you're writing a story about that what is the structure of that? So if she was writing a story about her life or loosely based on her life or loosely based off her own experience, would there be moments of complete blackout? Would there be moments of having the person with the cricket bat at all times in the corner of the room? Would there be her referencing someone with a cricket bat in the corner of the room at all times, but they might not be there? Do we ever meet the person with a cricket bat? Are they real or are they not? Um, what is it to be existing in a moment that's really, really important for them to just cut out and then wake up somewhere else. Or for moments to cut in and cut out at really unsatisfying times, for us to wake up in the middle of a conversation, for us to go in the middle of a conversation. It affects the structure of how she wanted to tell that story. So I suppose I'm using that as an example related to kind of some of the things that you'll have been thinking about. Now, you don't have to share anything you don't, don't feel comfortable with. Obviously, identity is a very private thing, but is anyone anything that they would like to share or anything that they thought about that was useful within all them kind of things that we were just looking at, writing through, using through? It's completely okay if not. <laughs> It's not um, it's not so much about, I suppose, like not sharing about my identity, but more so like what came up from doing that. And I think it's like things that what well, how I, what I thought is like there's things that you know about yourself and that you're fully aware of, obviously, because it's you're you and it's your life. But I think it's things, I suppose, that you kind of just accept and and you do because it's a part of you and it's the world you're from. But then I've never really thought about like in deep in like on a, on a deep conscious level about how that kind of filters that into like structure in terms of like what you just said about the the the, the girl who was going to faint and the you know feeling like you know the, the this person with the bat at the corner of the room that's that's a concept that's very much real and i think everybody has those concepts you know in your own identity but i suppose I've never, 
I think in terms of like voice and things like that, I've always been aware of like, you know, how that kind of is a part, uh, uh, how it coincides with my identity, but never, in, I don't think I've ever thought about it in like a, in a structural way. And yeah. I mean, when you were like, you could be right forever. It's like, yeah, like, oh my God, this is a cat open a kind of worms. <laughs> I feel like it does, doesn't it? Because you think, oh man, like I don't experience any satisfaction with any of those things or I experience more satisfaction or I'm interrupted every month with something that I have no control over or um, I, um, I experience pain when it's cold all the time and it just sets my day off or um, my thoughts are not collected in a neurotypical way so why would the thoughts in my plays be collected in a neurotypical way um why would um yeah or if you're someone who who does experience you know a lot of direction a lot of privilege a lot of coasting a lot of whatever what is it to be bound by something like that and not want to be bound by it yeah what is it, what is it to be told where you have to go and told where you're supposed to be and then go but i'm not any of those things and i don't want to be in that i don't want my story to exist in that way um so yeah completely um anyone else got any thoughts or anything they'd like to share I think that, yeah, for me, um, there's something really interesting about when people step outside the comfort zone of how to tell a story. And I'm thinking I was uh, particularly in, in relation to um, like the, what you said about society and the kind of dominant forces and, 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 and actually our, our traditional sense of kind of three act structure is kind of wrapped up in that and, and what we kind of anticipate. And I was thinking about um, Michaela Cole and and I may destroy you and the storytelling of that and how visceral that was and how people really responded to it and the honesty of that um but the 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 way that she the way that she structured that entire series um and subverted a lot of our expectations around you know conflict and resolution and you know neat answers and and also kind of put us in that role of kind of experiencing things as as the series went along you know I think kind of opens up the possibilities rather than kind of going oh you have to do it this way you know and and, it, and, and I think Mikhail is kind of an interesting one because I also know you know like having listened to like podcasts with her and you know that actually there, there's a real kind of journey of having to go no this is my story this is the way I want to tell it and having to fight for the telling of that story and not letting it become something else the more kind of dominant you know forces of our society kind of dictating it should be something else and I think that there's something in that for me about what structure is and why we need to employ it rather than it's something that we need to learn by rote and it's you know like you do your homework and you you do it the good way and do it the right way um it's actually about going how does it free up and unlock the story that i want to tell you know um sorry i feel like i've kind of slightly gone off <laughs> but like not at all not at all that makes complete sense and i think at the start of the session i said i don't believe in structure and I don't believe in it, but, but I, but I do, I don't believe in how we should do it. And I believe it's something that we should find and we should harness and we should employ on ourselves. It's like, um, let me start that thought again. Cause I kind of went off there. I believe the way that we've told, the way that we've been told structure exists isn't how it needs to be. I think that's what it is. Mm. And I believe in this way that I want to structure thoughts. Or structure stories not in the way that we should and i think a lot of the time for me like structure is taught like a science or a you know yeah. like like maths or whatever whereas actually art isn't like that and we and, and even you know down to how we experience life as humans you know we all try and attach or we're told to kind of attach like a three-act structure to it you know subconsciously or whatever else but but really life is never that neat it's never that you know it, it, we all kind of 
exist in this random chaos. Sorry, it's all getting very <laughs> existential over here. Um, but like, but I think there's something in um, that that human need to try and find a meaning in the meaninglessness of it. And actually, if you can kind of, um, I think as as artists, to an extent, we need to be able to free ourselves from that that arbitrary kind of meaning um and i think it doesn't it doesn't serve anyone yeah it doesn't serve anyone and what it does is when you fit your stories into them you're you're trying to appeal to something that might not be built for you mm. like it's <laughs> the way that structures sell the way that theater sells the way that we're told it should be isn't built it, I, I doubt you would have come to this session if you felt like it was built for you <laughs> so if, if you didn't, you know, you are, um, that's why you're here, right? So you're kind of like, well, how can I get rid of that? It's not built for you. So why, why do we have to, why do we have to like shave down the crunchy bits or like mold together our soft parts and push it into that? Because it actually doesn't even serve the story. It doesn't serve the story you're telling. It doesn't, it doesn't highlight the story you're telling. If you're someone who's bilingual, who switches between languages all the time, why are you writing your play in one language? If you're someone who speaks, if you're someone who speaks a visual language like a sign language or a BSL or ASL or whatever, why are you writing your story down? It's not meant to be written down. It's meant to be, it comes through gesture. It comes through sign. It comes through feeling. If you're, um, I don't know, if you're visually impaired, why are you writing your story? Why aren't you speaking your story out loud? <laughs> if you're, um, you know, am I, am I making sense? Am I making sense? I hope I am. I hope I'm making sense. Um, and and how those and how identity shifts your perception of like <clears throat> many different things. I read this article years and years ago when I was doing a play, and it it said that um, how if you're someone who speaks more than one language or has or has more than one culture, your perception of time is completely different. And I was like. Oh, well, like time's an immovable thing, right? And it's like, no, time's a concept that we've made up. Time is something that we've made up to try and rationalize how the world moves forward. It's not real, it's just a concept. You can't prove that it exists, we're just told that it is. And if you speak more than one language or you experience more than one culture, then the way that you spend time, the way that you interact with time, the words, even down to the words that you use for time mean different things. So of course you're gonna experience the concept of time differently. And I think that's how you can relate it back to story that if you're someone, going back to an example I used before, if you're someone who's having an affair, I think I'm talking about affairs because I'm writing something about an affair at the moment. But um, if you're someone who's having an affair, for example, and it's between um, a white cis woman, cis het woman and a, and a white cis het man, that story won't exist the same as if it's between... Um, uh, an Indian Pakistani queer woman and um, a disabled non-binary Bulgarian person, right? Because them two identities crash into that story in a completely different way. You've got three different cultures already in that. And just say they've met in this country, then you've got four different languages existing in that. You've got two different genders, which experience in a different way. And if someone's non-binary, then they've had their own journey away from a gender and into a new one. And, and then you've got queerness that adds on top of that. And, and, and it's like them, them identities don't fit into that same story as, as if it would do if it was two people like that. I hope I'm making sense. My brain races sometimes before I can blow over. Um, cool. Um, we are now very much at the end of the session. Um, I don't know if you want to like quickly wrap it up um, with maybe putting in the chat like some thoughts and things to explore, maybe a little sentence about a thought you've had and then something you want to take further and like keep pulling the thread on um, after this session. Um, and then we can have a moment for any questions that anyone's got um, before we finish. Um. um, I wanted to ask, I'd be really interested in like hearing if people have exam examples where they think the structure has been really interesting in or, you know, subverted something like maybe it could be something that could be shared after this session if people don't have ideas straight away. But I, I would really like to read like plays or, you know, screenplays that have in kind of different structures or interesting structures. 
Yeah, I think two examples, two examples of plays I thought before this session was obviously Generations by Denny, Debbie Tucker Green, which I mentioned before. Um, another play I saw recently was called um, All White Everything But Me by Kemi Bo Jacobs. Um, I don't know if it was published or not. I don't know. I hope it was because it was very good. Um, but it was a one person play by um, Kemi Bo about um, Anthea, I forget her last name, which is really bad because that's what the whole thing's about. It's about the first ever black woman ten tennis star. And it's about how the entirety of tennis is a very white sport. It's also very clinically white with everything that you wear and about how she was completely forgotten and lost into the whiteness of it all. Um, and the way that she structured that was really interesting. Um, what other things? I thought as well, another, it's not a play, but a good film, I think, take structure and fucks with it is Parasite I just think is such a great film um because it, it you think it's going somewhere and then it goes oh oh no I didn't think it was gonna go there I think a lot of like um Korean cinema does that and I think sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to be a play kind of inspiration for it can be anywhere but I think me and you Adam Box of Tricks Adam there's two Adams on this call <laughs> um we should maybe put a little list together and maybe send it out afterwards what do you think yeah that that, that sounds great I mean I, I was I was thinking that, that, uh, Ali McDowell I think a lot of the time oh, kind yeah. of subverts um expectations I mean I remember I, I forgot what the play's called which is which is bad but um the one with the uh no spo sorry it's a complete spoiler um but there's got a time machine in it you kind of I remember watching it, it was in the World Exchange studio um but the name of it eludes me but um and I remember just being like, oh, okay, I think it's one thing. It's about this group of lads uh, in Northeast sat around, you know, and and it was really good kind of enjoying it. And then just before the interval, they introduced the fact that, oh, yeah, brilliant adventures. Thank you, Adam. Um, and it's there's there's a time machine in the, the corner of the room and it's like, you know, that they've built from like a cardboard box. And it's, and it, but it, it's absolutely, they have built this, you know, one of the lads has built this thing. And it just suddenly kind of this play that you thought was one thing just goes, what? You know, mm -hmm. and the, the satisfaction of that. And in fact, you know, Pomona and um, what's the one at the, the, that was on recently, the what it, um, Royal Court uh, X. So X. Yeah. You know, again, like how, how, how you can kind of use form and structure and take expectation and then completely subvert it I think is really interesting um and also that th there's a space that when, when whenever you tell a story on stage for me that there needs to be another dimension you can't just you know if you if you can tell it in a kind of um traditional kind of because I think a lot of this you know um a lot of this discussion that we're having around structure a lot of those rules do sort of come from the world of TV. I'm not, I'm not kind of TV bashing, um, but like, I think there's that, that, I, that idea is, you know, how to write a screenplay, how to write this. And, you know, if you just follow these basic rules about how to structure something, then you will unlock, you know, a career in, you know, writing TV and film. But actually, I the most interesting people are the one, you know, the most interesting writers for me are the ones that kind of take that and then chew it up and spit it out and, you know, make it their own, you know. Um, but yeah, I think um, yeah, I'd 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 be I'd really love to kind of start off a a list of um, different plays and 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 I was thinking like Memento as well. I don't know if anyone's seen Memento. It's about twenty years old. It was a film, um, but yeah, it's brilliant. Like about like losing your memory and then, but the way that it's structured, it's very much like you're living through the protagonist's eyes and you're kind of you're disorientated in the same way. Um, and you never know who to trust or who not to trust. And there's something about that kind of disorientating experience, I think. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, any last thoughts? I've read them all in the chat. And Caroline, I've just realised your message from before got lost, but I really hear what you're saying um, there about like discovering it later on with the life can like, can really mess with the structure of things. I would absolutely love to read a story about a woman who doesn't find her sexuality until her seventies, like, and how that would affect the structure. I would absolutely love that. It feels like a story that needs to be written that I've not seen yet. Um, so yeah, I think it really can. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad it's been useful. I'm sorry it's been like a whistle stop too, and we didn't quite get around everything I wanted to. But I hope it's just kind of give you all a little thought to like go ahead with and 
feel less scared about it. Like you don't need to be scared of structure. I am still a little bit scared of it, but <laughs> don't need to be as scared as we are. Um, yeah. All right. We're on time. We're on time. Amazing. Thank you so much, Danica. Um, I just, yeah, I think, I think the big takeaway for me is actually that, that, that idea that you just start from the idea of what it can create and what the potential of structure rather than the limitations of it i think you know and how we kind of we constantly feel like we have to kind of follow a particular a particular way of doing things which is um which is wrong um so yeah fantastic session thank you so much um just a little bit of uh promotion uh for upcoming playmakers events um we've got our playmakers takeover at uh, home uh coming up on the 21st of january which is a saturday and um, we've got loads of brilliant events um as part of that and um, so do check that out um we have also got in two weeks time um conway mcdermott our uh, playwright in residence is leading a session on finding your voice as a writer so if you haven't already please do sign up for that um but yeah just to say thank you so much for being such a wonderful group and kind of contributing and and getting involved in uh, fascinating conversations and yeah i i think I, I a lot of these things like Danica's suggesting we could kind of keep talking about because i think the more that we kind of disrupt the um perceived way of doing things the more kind of interesting stories emerge so yeah thank you so much um everyone for joining us and thank you so much to nika um absolutely fantastic today thank you thank cheers you. guys have a lovely rest of the evening and i'll see you all again soon take care bye, bye.